Hey there, YouTube. You are here because you want to learn the ultimate success system. And today, I am going to show you the ultimate success system. So last night, my wife and I were talking, and I said, it's really fascinating to me how people view the Bible. And they view it from a perspective where it seems like people just think of the Bible as a bunch of symbols. Like, you know, you've got um, the symbol of the cross, right? You've got the symbol of the Star of David. You've got um, the symbol of the Bible itself is like a symbol. And so it's like something people refer to, it, and it's very symbolic for most people. But the Bible is not a book that's predominantly about symbols. The Bible is a book that's predominantly about systems. And I like what uh, W. Edwards Deming said. He said, systems under which people work account for 90% of the failure. Therefore, the key to success in any endeavor is to perfect the system. What is a system? A system is like an organized way of doing a thing or a series of things to ensure that it's going to work out in a way that you desire it to work out. That's a system, right? And so the Bible is a book of systems. And I, I was thinking about that. Um, and so if you think about you think about how people view the Bible when it comes to systems, well, you have, you have, we, we got this thing called the past, we got this thing called the past, right? And then we have this thing called the present, and then we have this thing called what? The future, right? And so how the Bible relates to us, in fact, in fact, not just even the Bible, just in life in general, how we as human beings operate, what happens is we have this we have these things in the past called memories, right? Uh, memories. And in the present, we have these things called actions. And in the future, we have these things called expectations. So when we understand that we have memories and then actions and expectations, what happens, the Bible is a system that is that is designed to teach us how to take actions in the present. So a lot of people think it's just, well, it's got all these stories, right? So the Bible's got these stories about the past. Well, it does. But the stories about the past aren't about the past that the stories are about. What does it tell us in Romans chapter 14? I think it's verse 17. It says, the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. What's hope? Hope is a well-founded, well-grounded expectation for the future. So the purpose of the stories from the past are to empower our expectations for the future. So that when we have empowered expectations for the future, then we take right action in the present. Is, is what I'm saying making sense? And so what happens is, what happens is we make the mistake of not understanding what it's about. Because you, you take a lot of people who, re, who believe the Bible, um, and they've been attempting to do what the Bible says, and they've even, um, for, from all different walks of life, a lot of people think that the Bible exists only to teach us how to die, to tell us what happened in the past, or to teach us how to die. And they miss, like, the, the thing that it's about. And that is, like, the, st the stories from the past, right? So, and then uh, this is how, how to die. The stories about how they lived. How they lived. But it's really about, these stories about how they lived are more about how to live. This is how we should live. Right? So think of the Bible as a guidebook of systems that teach us systems so that as we're going through life and we're doing life, we're doing this thing called life, it, it does more than just prepare us to die. Like, it's not just about, okay, I'm just doing everything I can to get to heaven, but wow, there, you're going to have a whole life down here on this earth before you get to heaven that you got to do something with. So, I was reading in Luke, here's what it says. I, 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 love the, I love the fact that the Bible, like, uses systems to teach us about systems. Okay, watch this. It says in Luke chapter 6, verse number 43, here's what it says, 43 to 49, here's what it says. For a good man bringeth forth, I mean, I mean, for a good tree bringeth forth, bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit, uh, for of thorns, do men not gather figs, 
nor a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasures of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasures for, treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Now, so a couple things. He was saying, if you want to understand the root, look at the fruit. That's one of the things we learn from a tree, right? If you want to understand the root, like if I want to know what kind of tree this is, all I have to do is look at what fruit's growing on. Because I know if I look at the fruit, I understand the root. If I look at an orange growing on a tree, I know I'm not looking at an apple tree. Can I get a witness? Right? And so what happens is people have to, people have to, we have to wrap our minds around just like a tree is known by its fruit, so are we. People are evaluating our root based on our fruit. What is my fruit? My fruit are the things that I do and the things, the words that come out of my mouth. The, the scripture says, a man shall eat good by the what? Fruit of his mouth. What is the fruit of your mouth? Are you bringing forth corrupt fruit or are you bringing forth good fruit? Now, this is why, like, I believe that you should never use profanity. In business, in life, at home, never, ever, 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 ever. Like, I know, like, my son who's in his 30s, my daughter in their 30s, they have never heard me use pr profanity, ever. You know how I know they've never heard me use it? Because I've not heard me use it. You know how, why? Because I don't use it. Why? Because the scripture says, let no evil communication proceed out of your mouth. And then in James, in James chapter four, James chapter, James chapter three, it says, it says that, um, that with your mouth, curse you, bless you God, you bless God with your mouth, but you curse man who's made after the similitude of God. He said that the fountain bring forth out of the same fountain that bring forth sweet water and bitter. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessings and cursing. And then he says this, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. See, when somebody uses, when I hear somebody use profanity, you know what I initially think? Oh, I can't trust this person. That's what I think. Now, maybe, maybe you don't think that. But I think I, I can't trust them. Why? They got a dirty heart. They got something in there that, like, there are certain situations. No, I don't trust you. Wouldn't trust you around my wife. Wouldn't trust you around my daughter. Wouldn't trust you around my granddaughter. Why? Because you got filth coming out of your mouth, so there's some filth in there. I, I didn't say that. I didn't say it. It wasn't the Bible. I, was, I just read it, right? Then, by the way, if you under, see, if you understood the power of words, not only would you not use profanity, you would not use negative talk about anything ever. Why? Because words are power. How powerful are words? Words are so powerful that God used them to create everything out of nothing in six days and chilled on the seventh day. Words are so powerful that it says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. And the word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was the light. In, in him was the light? In him who? In the word. That's right. Words bring light. In him was the light, and the light was the li and in him was the life, I'm sorry, was the life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That has not changed. There'll be people who disagree with me, but that's okay, they've been wrong before. They'll be wrong again, right? There'll be people who disagree with me about this topic, that words are important. Um, there's a book called, I don't know, how many of y'all have read the, um, the Hidden Messages in Water? Anybody in here read that book? Is that mind-blowing? It, it, Dr. Yamoto, I think it was Dr. Yamoto that wrote that one, right? Okay, uh, um, Dr. Yamoto wrote a book called the, the Many Hidden Messages in Water, or The Hidden Messages in Water. And it was so mind-blowing to me. Even though I knew words were powerful, I didn't realize how powerful. And so what he did was he took, he took water from a, from a water bottle, took water from a water bottle, and he dropped some water droplets in these Petri dishes, two different Petri dishes. On one Petri dish, he had like love and great gratitude and like words of like empowering beautiful words. On the other one, he wrote negative words. He flash froze them. So they'd turn into crystals like really fast. Well, what he saw was the Petri dish that had the positive words on the outside of it turned to these beautiful little snowflake patterns and the ones that had the negative words turned to these really ugly, gnarly, just disgusting looking patterns. Now, question. As far as we know, can water see? As far as we know. Can water see? No. As far as we know, can water read? As far as we know, no. 
As far as we know, can water think? No. But if you put negative words on the outside of a container of water, it negatively impacts the molecular structure of the water. Positive words are positively influences the, the, the molecular structure of the water. This is why we can't, this is one of the reasons why we can't, because we think with words also. This is why we can't afford to go around dwelling on negative thoughts. Because it negatively impacts us. Now, watch this. Water can't read, can't see, can't think. As far as we know, can it hear? As far as we know, it can't. But we can think, we can read, we can see, we can hear. And our body is 70% water and our brain is 90% water. And we think that negative words aren't going to affect us. We are delusional. That's delusion. I'm, am, I, am I talking too fast? Okay. Now, so then it says, it says, a good man out of the good treasure, verse 45, a good man out of the good treasure of heart, bringeth forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For, the out, for of the abundance of the heart, the ma his mouth speaketh. And then he says something mind-blowing. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Why are you calling me Lord, owner, master, Adonai, and not doing the things I'm telling you to do? You either lying when you talking, or you lying when you walking. But you lying. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them. And doeth them. And doeth them. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth the sayings of mine and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid a foundation on a rock. And when the floods arose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it. For it was founded upon a rock. What's the rock? The truth of the word of God. Build your life on the foundation of the truth of the word of God. Then it says, But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man without a foundation. Build his house upon the earth, against which the streams beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. Immediately it fell. Immediately it fell. And by the way, if you want to know when it fell, it fell immediately. And the ruin of that house was great. Jesus said, why are you calling me Lord and you're not doing the things which I said? God doesn't want us to do the things he says so we can be miserable. He wants us to do the things that we say so we can have an expected end. Okay, what do I mean? So we think of the Bible symbolically. So we wear a chain around our neck and we think that's the blessing. That's not the blessing. The blessing is in doing the words that are in the book. We carry a Bible. We have one on our coffee table. And we think that's how we're going to bring blessing into our house. That's not where the blessing comes from. The blessing comes from doing the things that are written in the book. And so what happens is we think about all of the symbolic stuff, and we, okay, but I received Christ. I'm going to heaven when I die. Okay, now you've learned how to die. Let's start learning how to live. Because the reason these stories exist, and it's so fascinating. You want to you really do a fun, like, fun Bible reading experiment? Under, read the Bible from this understanding. For every New Testament principle or promise, there is an Old Testament illustration. So when you're reading a story in the Old Testament, like, start looking for, okay, this is the pattern. This is the pattern. What's the principle that goes with this pattern? What are the principles? What principles can I deduce? See, Hebrew rabbis don't teach by telling. They teach by asking. Why? Because God wants us to come to the awareness of. And, like, if you make a statement, oftentimes you harden the will. But if you ask a question, it stimulates the conscious. Like, oh, what, what, yeah, why am I calling you Lord and not doing the things which you say? I either need to stop calling you that or I need to start doing the things you say. But something got to change. How many of y'all tracking? And so what we want to do is we want to make sure, we want to make sure that when we're looking at, this is... <laughs> When we're looking at these stories in the past, we're not just being entertained by them. We want to make sure that we're not just being educated by them. But we want to make sure we are looking at these stories to gain some kind of insight from the past about our future so we know what actions to take in the present. It's, it's like people ask me why I believe the Bible. Well, 
I believe it because I know it's true. Now, prove it's true. <laughs> I didn't say I believe it because I want you to know it's true. <laughs> know it or don't know it. I know it. How do I know it? Because I, you got to understand, I came to Christ when I was 16 years old. I had never read a book before. Oh, by the way, I used to cuss like a sailor. I cussed the wallpaper off a wall. Started cussing, the wallpaper just started wilting, right? <laughs> Myron must be in here. <laughs> the wallpaper's off the wall, okay? Um, but you know what? I know he changed me because when, cha when he saved me, the day after I got saved, it's a little skinny kid. So I was already a martial artist, and I'm pretty tough. I got six brothers, like, and my mom and dad were not, they were not having us running from a fight. Oh, no, not now, not never. In their words, not mine. I ain't raising no punk. <laughs> one of them mess with you, you grab the first one. A whole bunch of them, you grab the first one you can grab. You beat them, and within an inch of their life, the rest of them will leave you alone. I thought these kids are crazy, my parents are crazy, everybody's crazy, right? But they weren't crazy. It worked exact. they were prophets. It worked exactly like they said it would work. And so, like, I, I was never one to back down from a fight, ever, ever. Like, I didn't, I wasn't just not back, I, I didn't mind a fight. In fact, some of them I rather enjoyed. <laughs> I'm keeping it, y'all, yeah, yeah, like, we see in the side of mine, I didn't know, oh, it's there. Okay, is there. And, and so the day after I came to Christ, the next, more, the next day in shop class, because I went to William Penn Vocational High School, next day in shop class, this little skinny kid, who was my friend, I thought, and he was like, he was a peanut. Like, I could have broken him in half, like, easily. He sucker punched me in, front, in my jaw in front of the whole class. So now I get sucker punched, And everybody's going, ooh, right? So they try to, they want to see something. You know what I did? Nothing. That was not me. I was like, wow, this thing is real. <laughs> this thing really works. This whole salvation thing is real. Well, a little while later, I'm a friend of mine said, now you need to start reading the Bible. You got to understand, I was 17 when he's 16 or 17 when he said that to me. I had never read a book in my life that was not a comic book or a karate book. I didn't read books for school. I just looked for the answers, filled out the thing. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to do all that. I, was, I, was, I wasn't trying to do all that. Okay? I'm, so, why y'all looking at me with so much judgment, man? Did anybody else do that or was it just me? Okay, we, okay good. I got, some peeps in, I got some peeps in here. I got some peeps in here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now y'all can stop judging a brother. Okay, okay anyway. So, so I start reading this Bible, and I'm thinking to myself, he said, you need to start reading the Bible. I'm, and I'm thinking, you mean that big, thick book with no pictures? This is the exact opposite of a comic book. Right? This is the exact opposite of a comic book. No pictures, little bitty words, and they had enough nerve to put two columns on each page. I got to start reading this? That's, that's my thoughts. And I started reading it. I was like, what? If I do this, I can expect that? If I do this, I can expect that? If I do this, I can expect that? I said, I'm going to test this. I'm going to see. <laughs> For real. Now, I've got six brothers. We did not always get along. We always get along now. We didn't always get along back then. And we, we had a lot of intensity. We didn't have a, we had a lot of intensity. Me and my brothers, we still do have a fair amount of intensity. Not, not Uncle Rob. Me, my brother Jeff. Me, Jeff, Mike, we're the three oldest. We have some intensity. Dwayne has some sometimes. Derek, off the charts, and Mark, the, the youngest two. Okay, Rob and, Rob and Dwayne are the most subtle. Rob's the most chill. But don't take his chill for granted, though. Cause, right, <laughs> okay? <laughs> those, 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 those chill ones you got to kill, like, keep on, right? So anyway, the, my, my brother came in. He was, like, lit. He was, like, on fire. And he was, like, man. <laughs> and so I read this verse in Proverbs 15.1. I'm about to test this, see if this is real. A soft answer turneth away wrath, and grievous words stir up anger. So my brother came in lit. Like, he was on, on 1 to 10, he was on level 13. I'm like, wow, I'm really sorry to hear that. Oh, wow, yeah, I guess, you know, you do have a point there. I got, the louder he got, the more quiet I got. And, like, in a matter of seconds, this whole thing was totally de-escalated. And then when he left, I was like, that was amazing! That was amazing! I'm going to try something else. I remember one summer... 
one summer um, in Harrisburg. Um, I think I was 16 or 17. No, I was 17 or 18. 17 or 18. Um, one summer. And I was still in school because I, 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 I'm one of those people that love school. I love like the 10th grade so much I took it twice. <laughs> and that's not the real reason. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so it was one summer and nobody could find summer jobs. But there was a verse that said, if you're faithful, like if you bring, uh, bring your, sub, uh, bring your house, substance to the house of the Lord. Anyway, uh, Proverbs 3, um, talking about giving. Given shall be given to you, pre- a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men given to your bosom. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to test this giving thing. I said, I don't care what anybody else does. I got one job. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to make sure I, I always give God his first, right? That summer, no, kids couldn't find summer jobs. I had three jobs at the same time. I'm like, this thing works. This thing works just like God said it worked. And every time I found something in the Bible and it said, do, if you do this in this situation, and I did it, it worked just like he said it would. Now, here I am, 61 years of age, in some, I don't know, 2014, what was that? 2014 was nine years ago. I decided, maybe it was 2015, um, I decided, I found in the Bible, I found King Solomon's business model. I had never heard anybody talk about it. I had never heard anybody teach about it. And I, I, just, I kept reading, like, 1 Kings 1 through 3, 1 Kings chapter 3, 4, 5, all the way up through 1 Kings chapter 10, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 9, I'm like, this is amazing. This is the business that made Solomon the richest person in the world. I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, mod- I'm going to take his business. I'm going to model his business and see what happens. Now, you got to understand, 2014 was uh, 2000, 2013, 2014. Like, we had already made millions of dollars back in the early 2000s, and then we had already lost millions. And, like, we were, like, broke as a joke and ready to choke stuck like Chuck in a pickup truck, all that stuff, that was me. I was broke, right? I lived on borrowed money all of 2013, all of 2014, like all of it. Had a good friend, loaned me 4,000 a month. Like I helped him when he was down, now he's helping me while I'm down, right? So he loaned me 4,000 a month. And I'm like, I gotta figure something out. This was during the time when I'm sitting on the patio at our house in Lando Lakes, and I'm crying on my wife's shoulder, and it doesn't work, and every, every couple of months I gotta go, I'm going down to um, that loan place where you could loan money, they'd loan you money on your title down on Del Mabry and um, Waters Avenue. I'd go down there. They knew me, man. I, okay, yeah, I need to get five grand. I'll give it back to you and then pay them back. And then a couple months later, still didn't work. Went back. There. Like, so, like, I'm not giving, like, this is not fear. Like, I'm like, I'm broke when I decided I'm going to build my business based on King Solomon's business model. And so I started building my business on King Solomon's business model. And about 2016, it started working a little bit. 2017, it was like my first bounce back million dollar year. 2018, another million dollar year. Okay, cool. 2019, cool. A little over, almost two. 2020, 2.6. 2021, 6.2. This Bible is real. It works. All Like literally, I, I, and it sounds like an exaggeration. Like everybody who's watching on YouTube right now, go like the, the series that I did on Solomon a few months ago, like I did How Solomon Made Re- Me Rich. Go watch that video. I'm, I, I'm, like, I'm not trying to get you to watch videos, but I'm telling you, like I literally did what King Solomon did. I said, God, li- he didn't just download this wisdom into Solomon. After he downloaded the wisdom into Solomon, Solomon went out and did some stuff, and the Bible tells us what he did. And I said, I'm going to do the things he did. And maybe it'll work for me. Still, Thousands of years later, maybe it'll work. It works so well, it's insanical. Like, it's like what? Like, it's like end over end business growth every year, two to three times the business is growing, two to three times. Last year was way better than the year before, almost three times what it was the year before. Like 2022 was almost three times what 2021 was. And I'm I'm, I'm not bragging, I'm not, that has nothing to do with it. I'm just telling you, this Bible thing works. It works like, like nothing else. Like, if you think about this, if, if God used his word to make everything out of nothing in six days, you think he can't fix your problem in a year? But we got to know what the word is, right? And so, and so I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do, I'm going to build my business like King Solomon, 
built his business, and I'm gonna let the chips fall where they may. If it works, it works. If, if it, and so you go watch my video on how Solomon made me rich. Go watch the video on the the um, the wisdom, the wealth, and the wickedness of Solomon. Watch the video on um, Solomon's social media, King Solomon's social media. Like, and I'm I'm literally on my YouTube channel showing the things that I did showing the things that I did in my business that made our business grow end over end over end over end. And there's no, like, I believe fully, as like our business did so good last year. It was like, it was crazy. Oh, here, y'all want to hear the other amazing part? It was, it did this, re- we're talking about revenue that our business generates part-time. There's no hustle and grind. I don't do any eight, hour, I, don't, I don't do any 20-hour days. I don't even do any eight-hour days. Every now and then I'll do an eight-hour day if I'm traveling somewhere and, you know, it's not because I'm so smart. That's my point. It's not me. It's the word. And so the things that were written before time were written for our learning. So I went into the Bible and I found all this stuff about this guy, about this guy named Solomon, right? And Solomon was so wealthy. If he were alive today, if he were alive today, he'd be a multi-trillionaire. With the wealth he had back then, he'd be a multi-trillionaire. I'm like, I don't need a trillion. Like a nice cool billion is fine. Right? I don't need a trillion. I'll take a billion, though. A billion wouldn't be bad, right? Okay, 100 million. Okay, like, for, let's start. That, I ain't mad about it. See, here's the problem. You think it's hard because you think you're trying to figure out how you can do it. I have the ultimate leverage. What's the ultimate leverage? God's word. It's the ultimate leverage. Yeah. And I know there are people, you know, we always get the haters. Oh, all you care about is making money. All you ever talk about is money. Well, you apparently don't listen to me enough, <laughs> okay, for those of you who think that, right? Because I talk about a whole lot of other stuff other than money. But here's what I know. Here's what I know. Those haters that, like, oh, you talk about his money. It's people like me they go to to ask for money when they get stuck like Chuck in a pickup truck. I'm just keeping it real. I'm talking about folk in your chair. Here's what's fascinating to me. It's fascinating. Christians talk a great game. But we need to start walking a great game. I was a visiting, I was a visiting speaker at a church one time. And it was like a small crowd, Wednesday night, maybe 30, 40 people. They had prayer requests. Pray for so-and-so family, a member of our church, their house burnt down. One of the elders gets up and says, well, let's don't pray for them. Let's take up an offering for them. Cool. Take up an offering. Like, I'm, I'm all about it, man. My house didn't burn down. I can give them some money. I asked them the next day, how much did y'all get for the family whose house burnt down? $137. I don't even know the people. I put 100 in. I don't even know them. I never saw them. Didn't know who they were. All I knew was my house didn't burn down. And see, like, wisdom is better than strength, but a poor man's wisdom is despised. So, so I learned these lessons from this dude named Solomon. So I'm going to take the things that were written before time, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. So now I am going to expect to have some Solomon-esque in the future, Solomon Esque. I made that word up. So if I didn't spell it right, <laughs> who knows? Okay, so so I'm gonna I, I can expect to have some Solomon-esque results in the future if I take the same action Solomon took in the present. Me now. I'm this is me now. I'm gonna do now what Solomon did then. Like, I cannot emphasize this enough. The Bible is a book of systems. Systems under which people work account for 90% of the failure. Therefore, the key to success in any endeavor is to perfect the system. Here's your problem. You know what your problem is in your business? Your problem is you don't have a good system. You don't have a good system of lead generation, so you don't have enough people to sell to. You don't have a good system of customer acquisition because you don't have a core product offer. You don't have something. By the way, the best kind of core product offer is an educational core product offer. What does that mean? You sell them somebody. You sell them something. You don't sell them somebody. Don't do that. We don't want to be selling people. Yeah. We don't want to be selling people, y'all. Yeah. Okay, you sell them something. You sell them something. I, y'all are not allowed to sit beside each other. Okay, so you sell them something. You sell them something that teaches them something really, really valuable that they maybe perhaps haven't learned anywhere else. And guess what? When you do that, they will know you know, and they will trust you as an advisor. Instead of seeing you as a pesty salesperson, they're going to see you as a trusted advisor. I can trust that person. They know something I don't know, and they know a lot of stuff I need to know. So you sell them a core product offer that educates them, and it pre-frames them on the thing that 
is going to be the next thing you're going to help them with, and you're going to charge them more money. And then the reason you have a, your, the reason you, uh, your business is struggling, you don't have a you don't you don't have a, a system for selling premium value offers. You don't have a system for it. You may sell some every now and then. You may sell some core products every now and then. You may generate some leads every now and then. But you don't have systems in place where that happens perpetually around the clock every single solitary day. You don't have continuity products in place. You don't have a continuity offer system, right? See, we have all of those systems in place. Y'all are looking at a dude who did great in school all the way through the third grade. (laughs) And it went downhill from there. I liked the 10th grade so much I took it twice. Almost quit high school two weeks before my graduation. None of what I'm saying is an exaggeration. Now, I did pull myself together in my senior year. I graduated second in my class. It was a class of two, and my little brother was the valedictorian. So now y'all know the rest of the story. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it is what it is, right? Okay. So, so you say, well, Myron, what you want? Like, I am not telling you this because I'm a genius. It has nothing to do with it. I have a book filled with systems that tell me what I can expect in the future based on what I learned from the past that influence the actions I take in the present. And see, some of y'all don't have enough Old Testament story knowledge about all the stuff that happened. You, like, here's what you don't know. See, you don't know, you don't know the lessons from, from, from Abraham fighting for his family's freedom. Right? You don't, you don't know, you don't know the, see, you don't know the lesson. Like if you look at it, so, um, I'm getting chills thinking about this. So you, you go to, you go to, um, you go to Genesis chapter 10 and you see the table of nations. And then you go to Genesis chapter 11 and you see that God divided the people based on languages. Then you go to Genesis chapter 12 and God calls Abram. And then Genesis chapter 13, the scripture says in verse two, and Abram was very rich in cattle in silver and in gold. And then chapter 13, after his nephew, Lot, goes to Sodom, five nations, five kingdoms come against Sodom and Gomorrah, conquer Sodom and Gomorrah, take all the people as their slaves, lots among them. (laughs) Abraham, the 70-something year old dude, he's like, no, no, you can't have my nephew. And here's what it says. He armed, and I don't remember how many it was, I think it was 325 servants that were born in his house. He armed his servants that were born in his house, which means if he armed them, they already knew how to use the arms. He didn't start training them to fight after Lot got taken. He trained them how to fight before he got taken. Why? Because people were taking over people's stuff all the time back then. They didn't know, they they didn't only work for Abram, they knew how to defend Abram's stuff. That we going to, where are we going, boss? We going to get my nephew. And this businessman went out and fought against five nations and won. What? What lessons do we learn from that? Well, there's a lot of lessons we learn. One, your family needs a war chest. See, but you probably never heard anybody, like all the sermons you heard about money are like tithe and give, give and tithe, tithe and give, and that's good. But wait a minute. If you do the right thing with 10% of your money and the wrong thing with 90%, you're still going to be a broke tither. I want, Pastor, show me what I can do with the other 90%. I got the 10% down. Yeah, that's there. Now, what can I do with the other 90% to develop my war chest to fight for my family's financial freedom? And what's interesting is, Abraham wasn't worried about how the battle was going to turn out. You know why? Because he already had a promise. And that promise wasn't yet fulfilled. And as long as the promise wasn't fulfilled, he was invincible. Because God cannot lie. David, David goes down to take his brother some grub. He's the little brother. What are you doing down here, bro? You just came down because you were nosy. You just wanted to see the battle. Sorry, bro, I hate to break it to you. I don't see no battle. Y'all hiding. When y'all going to do something? Didn't you see that giant? Yeah, I saw him. I'll fight him. Let me at him. What did you learn? Well, see, David had some past experiences when he fought against a lion and he fought against a bear and won. Have you ever seen how big a lion is in real life? Have you ever seen how big a bear is in real life? I don't want to meet a lion. I don't want to meet a bear. I don't want to deal with none of them. I sure don't want to fight them over a sheep. If I, now, I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying, if, if I was David, I'd have said, 
you good, Mr. Lion, or do you want a second course? <laughs> like, I am not fighting a lion for a lamb. But David said, no, I'm not afraid. Why was David not afraid? Because the, 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 the oral Torah he knew from the oral Torah that was passed down from his father and his father's 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 father. He knew that God told Abram, I'm going to bless those that bless you. I'm going to curse those that curse you. And you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. David knew. You can't do nothing. Now you want to hurt me. Don't you know who I am? See, I know who I am based on whose I am. And see, that's the problem. The problem is we have, you're using the Bible as a symbolic methodology. We, we, too many, too many Christians are thinking of God as a genie and the Bible as a lamp. We just rub it when we need, oh, dear God, give me this, give me that. Oh, dear God, help me with this, help me with that. God said, I already helped you. I gave you the word. Go get, go, go, go use the word to get the problem, the problem solved. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That feels a little bit like work, don't it? <laughs> but here's, what, here's my whole point. The Bible's a book of systems. The more of those systems you understand and apply, the better your life becomes. I don't want to just know. The, I don't. I just. I don't want to know what the Bible says just so I can know how to die. I want to know what the Bible says so I can know how to live. I want to know what the Bible says so I can know how to live, so I can live that way, so I can show my family how to live, so I can demonstrate this book is real. This is not some fairy tale. This is not some fantasy land. This is like real life. This is the essence of life. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And his law. By the way, when you think law, don't think judge, police, arrest, sentence to prison. That's not, it's not that kind of law. It's a law like the law of gravity is a law. It's a law like the law of momentum is a law. The principles, the teaching and instruction of God. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that bringeth forth his fruit and the seeds of the leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I read that when I was a teenager. I thought, what if it's true? What if it's true that everything I do, based on these principles, everything I do will prosper? What if that's true? And here's what I found out. It's so true. It's not just true. It's truth. And the difference between what's true and what's truth is true can change, but truth can't change. I'm in Florida, that's true. It won't always be true. One of these days I'll go to Pennsylvania. Then I'll, it will no longer be true that I'm in Florida. <laughs> right now I'm at my office. Later on today, I'll be at the golf course. I'm at my office. That's true, but it ain't truth. Why? It's true, but it ain't truth because it can change. If it can change, it's not truth. Truth can't change. And, and, and so it's, it's really interesting. He says, he says, He's like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. He brings forth his fruit in the season. Whatsoever his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And I thought to myself, what if I could li Where Can somebody lead me to the believers, the Bible believers, the followers of Christ, the people who whatsoever they do prospers? I want to see some of those people. Where we, where we, where we at, y'all? Where we at? Where are the people who are showing people? who are showing the world the light that is in this word, that we're living it. So other people say, ooh, I want some of that. Pagan kings came to Solomon. Why? He had God's secrets, and he knew God's systems. And here's what's fascinating. Another passage that I learned when I was a teenager, and I said, well, what if it's true? It says, as the rain cometh down snow from heaven, and it watereth the earth, and it maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give bread to the eater, that's consumption to the one that consumes, and seed to the sower, oh, that's production for the one that produces, here's what God said, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, and it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. Man, are you talking about a prosperity gospel? I'm, that's not a term I see in the Bible. I'm talking about biblical prosperity. I'm not talking about name it and claim it. I'm not talking about speaking things into existence. I'm not talking about blabbing. I'm talking about saying what God said to my situation and knowing that it shall be done. It, you know what's fascinating? I, I, it's fascinating 
that when God's ideal environment for man, do you ever notice how many times the Bible talks about a garden? Fascinating. I heard a really cool saying yesterday t- talking about Abraham. He said, I would rather be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Anyway, God's ideal environment for man was a garden. He put Adam and Eve in the garden enclosure of Eden, pleasure. God's ideal environment for man is the protected place of pleasure. Why did he put the man in the garden? Why does the Bible tell us? By the way, a lot of people think that work is the result of sin. Work is not the result of sin. God gave man work to do when he put him in the garden and says he put him there to dress it and keep it before man ever sinned. So the work is not the result of sin. Work is the result of being made in the image of God. Myron, why do you work? Because I'm exercising my God likeness. <laughs> well, fascinatingly enough, what is a garden? It's a place where you plant seeds in the ground and then you cultivate those seeds until they grow up and produce a harvest, right? Okay. It's interesting that Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. The tomb, like, like, is in a garden. The tomb where he was buried is in a garden. It's really fascinating, too. Like, when you go to Israel, and there's this garden, and there's this wine press in the garden and where they would crush the grapes, and then not too far from that, there's a tomb, and the tomb is it's, it's a cave. It's just, it's just it's, the whole thing is really fascinating that Christ died, he was buried like a seed, He rose from the grave to give us life, and we are the harvest. But guess what? My life is a garden. Because man is made from the dust of the ground. Hmm. And God planted a seed of creativity, connection, and contribution inside of every single solitary one of us. You want to understand the system? It's the law of the farm that reigns supreme. You reap what you sow. But here's what's really cool about the whole reaping what you sow thing. You reap later than you sow. You don't sow today and reap today. Right? You sow in the spring, you reap in the fall. So you sow, you reap later than you sow. But guess what? You plant a seed, you grow a tree. You also reap more than you sow. But you reap the same thing that you sowed. Everything reproduces after its own kind. So God planted an aspect and the aspect of the seed of his creativity inside this dirt. What's my job? My job is to let Isaiah 55 work in my life. What's Isaiah 55? Isaiah 55, I think it's 11 and 12, it says, as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. Huh. So I'm supposed to let the word, the rain and the snow, the water of the word of God, rain down into my life saturate the soil that is Myron Freddie Golden so that the seed of the aspect of creativity and connection and contribution that God put inside of me is able to be fruitful and multiply. Maybe you're not producing fruit because you forgot to water the earth. The Bible, reading the Bible is not a thing that we do so we can check it off. I want to get this book in me so I can, I want to know the stories of the past. I want to know the promises so I can know what to expect in the future so I can take action in the present because every action I take in the present, it doesn't, doesn't matter what it is, every action everybody takes in the present is based on an outcome they expect in the future. Guess what? When you begin to read the word of God and you begin to fill your mind with the patterns and the principles and the promises and the prayers and the prophecies and the precepts and the practices, you begin to have better expectations about outcomes in the future that empower you to take actions in the present that you couldn't take before you watered this earth with the word of God. It's the ultimate system. Like, I don't, I didn't start a YouTube channel because I want people to think I'm awesome. I'm only awesome when I'm awesome. When I'm not awesome, I'm really not awesome. Don't look at me like that, you too. But I want you to understand that the word of God has your answers. The answer you've been looking for your whole life, they are in there. And the more you saturate your life with this word, the better your life will become. This is not, I'm not guesstimating. I'm not pontificating. 
I'm not exaggerating. This is like, this is, there, it does not make any sense. It makes no logical human sense that this dude, Mr. ADD, ADHD, ABCDEFG, <laughs> colorblind, dyslexic, barely made it out of high school, had polio as an infant, second of seven brothers born to poor, hardworking parents. There's no universe in which this makes any logical sense. And I am telling you, everything in my life turned around when I started applying God's word to my life. It changed the game for you, y'all. It's the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate success system. Saturate your life with the word of God. It'll change everything. By the way, the most important thing it changes is you. Because that's the whole objective anyway. The objective is to make you and me more like him. That's the objective. Let's be about it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for commenting. Thanks for notification belling and YouTubing and all the other YouTube stuff y'all do. Y'all know what to do. I, I, I don't even know why I'm asking y'all to do that. Do it anyway. But anyway, looking forward to seeing y'all in the next video. In the meantime, in between time, peace out, Cub Scouts. God bless.